Hello, your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm Dr. Peggy Mason. She's a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago in the U.S. She has received numerous teaching awards. Professor Mason wrote a single author textbook designed for medical students titled Medical Neurobiology, which was published back in 2011. And Professor Mason, Mason's research focuses on the neurobiological basis of empathy and helping. And those are precisely the topics that we're going to cover today in our interview. So, Dr. Mason, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Of course. Okay, great. So, the first thing I would like to ask you is, so nowadays, and I guess... That of course. Okay, great. So the first thing I would like to ask you is, so nowadays, and I guess that since Darwin, when we think about uh, a behavior coming from an organism like humans or others, uh, and in this case, empathy, perhaps we could start by talking a little bit about uh, how did empathy evolve? I mean, did, did it start... Uh, as an emotion uh, for attachment between uh, mothers and their children and then develop to other things like, for example, attachment between people and their friends and family and others? Um, um, well, empathy is pretty difficult to, uh, to detect. You can't really detect the empathy. You can detect the consequence of the empathy, right? Which, in our case, is helping. Um, and in the case of mammals, mm -hmm. it's thought that that empathy has developed from that maternal offspring bond. Is that true? It it's pretty. That's a pretty difficult hypothesis to prove or disprove. Um, and, and I'll say a few things, which is that helping that same consequence mm -hmm. for a question mark reason has also, is also found throughout the, the animal kingdom, including, you know, very much so in ants, mm -hmm. um, and, and other insects, um, throughout the, the vertebrate phyla. And so uh, what the internal basis for helping is, uh, is unclear. But in the case of mammals, what is clear is that there, is, there are affective pathways that are common to all of the members of the species, mm -hmm. uh, not just a mother and not just offspring, but males and adults adult females that are not mothers and and all sorts of um, all sorts of categories of, of individuals and they share this affect these affective pathways and for that reason maybe it's not that surprising that they also share this thing that mothers and offspring have now on the other hand it may be that we all started with this because in fact helping another it within a group makes the group uh, more apt to survive. Mm -hmm. So it may be that it started from hurting behavior and mothers just got a little extra hormonal boost to it. Um, I, I think that the definitive phylogenetic analysis has not been made. And one of the problems is with mammals, you, you really can't make it because everyone is an obligate nurser, mm -hmm. right? So you don't really have a, a, a contrast to, to study. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, one of, a very easy way to think about this is that mothers have to know how their offspring are feeling. So they have this ability to detect the affective state of their offspring and if they don't detect it, their offspring die, and they're an evolutionary dead end. So that's a, that's a you know that's a very possible, plausible possibility. But I don't, in my opinion, it's not, not proven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so since you, mm -hmm. 
Okay, so since we haven't yet determined its phylogenetic history, the phylogenetic history of empathy and where it started and how it really evolved, um, do, do we already know at least uh, perhaps the regions or the br of the brain or the neurobiological bases of empathy, that is, the places of the brain where it is processed by us and all other species as well? As well. I mean, well, not all other species, but in a mammal, let's say in a mammal, in a, mm -hmm. um, there are certainly pathways in the brain that we think are more, are much more involved than others. And so these are, for one, the affective pathways. Places such as the amygdala and the hypothalamus that allow us to, to feel things, feel affects, feel what we will then term emotions, and to use, the, use that affect to motivate behavior. It also would appear that the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, is heavily involved. And one possibility is that it's it's that this affective is this bottom-up pathway that allows you to to match another's um, affect. And then there's this top-down that allows you to to do nuanced things, such as decide that. The affect that you're feeling is is actually somebody, another individual's issue. Mm -hmm. So in our experiments, there's a trapped rat, and we know that it's critically important that the the not trapped rat, the helper rat, feels distress. If the helper rat doesn't feel distress, he doesn't help. It's it's perhaps even more important that he feels distress than the trapped rat feels distress. And so, um, but if the, if the helper rat feels too much distress, he can't help. So they have to be able to say, oh, okay, I feel this way. It's not me. I have to make an action that's oriented to that other individual, an other oriented action. And, um, and that is where I, I think, I mean, I don't do this work, but my read of the literature is that the prefrontal cortex is very critical to doing, um, for making processes such as that go. Another example in humans, and this has been demonstrated to depend on the prefrontal cortex, is a physician. Now, if I get a shot, and if, and if you know, I don't watch, but if I did watch, I would be very empathic myself or empathic to somebody else getting a shot it would it would very much affectively arouse me mm -hmm. but physicians watching people get shots it's non-arousing they don't feel that much empathy for them but they have this big activation in prefrontal cortex so the idea is they have this activation in prefrontal cortex that allows them to dampen down their affective response to something that they see every day all the time. Um, so that's the kind of, those are the kind of um, pathways that we're thinking about. There's one to come up and give you that emotion, and then there's one top down to dampen it and contextualize it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since we're talking about empathy, uh, I'm not sure if today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since okay, and since we're talking about empathy, uh, I'm not sure if today people still talk a lot about this. But I guess that in back in the '90s, uh, mirror neurons got a lot of hype, and so uh, and I mean I would like to ask you if uh, there's something to it that is to the idea that we have a specific uh, types of neurons that deal with uh, I guess. Uh, the processing of social information and empathy and uh, that allow for us to uh, think about what might uh, might be going in other people's heads when we look at their behavior and their facial expressions and things like that or or if it's really just a matter of uh, neural pathways yeah i mean there are not too many things in the mammal where 
uh, one type of neuron is responsible for something. It's kind of not the way the mammalian brain works in general. It generally works by circuits. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the first answer. So, you know, I, I think that attributing something to a neur one neuronal population is probably a mistake. Mm -hmm. And attributing something to mirror neurons in specific is probably a double mistake. Um, mirror neurons, I, you know, I, I can't... I can't do a full critique of mirror neurons, but I would refer you to uh, Gregory Hickok, who wrote The Myth of Mirror Neurons. And he's done a very careful and thorough um, analysis of, of how, you know, this very well-named group of cells has captured everyone's imagination and, and everyone puts their aspirations and their human exceptionalism hopes onto this group of neurons. Um, I didn't drink that Kool-Aid, and so uh, not only do I don't think that they're, uh, they are solely involved, I don't even know that they exist in humans, and I don't even know that they're involved at all. So I, I think our, our best bet is to follow the pathways that are described in us and other mammals. I don't think we're particularly exceptional mammals. We're good ones, but so are rats, and so are everyone. So are all the species. So um, I, I would follow the circuits. That would be where I would put my money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've already referred to parts of the brain, like the amygdala. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've already referred to parts of the brain, like the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the prefrontal cortex. But uh, when I read something about uh, the areas of the brain that process social information in humans and other species, one of the areas that really gets a lot of reference to is the temporoparietal junction. The, does it have something to do with it, with empathy as well? I'm, I'm sure. It, the temporal TPJ, let's, let's go for TPJ, temporal yeah. parietal, let's go for TPJ, temporal yeah. parietal junction. Sure. It is a, you know, it's sort of the mirror neurons, uh, the area version of a mirror neuron. Everyone has a lot of aspirations for the TPJ. It's the linguistic, uh, sort of magic zone that turns sounds into meanings. It's It's got a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of very high-minded functions that it's been implicated in. And, that, and I think that a lot of that is probably right. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's probably involved. How much it's, how it works with the rest of them, I mean, it's a little bit, um, it's not a little bit, it is a problem to see the brain as a bunch of separate blobs. And to say that this region does this and that region does that. And, you know, while it's true that the motor cortex is very important for voluntary movements or critical for voluntary movements, once you pass through the primary cortices, there's not too much in the telencephalon where you can say it does this, only this, all this. Um, it's just not that way. So yeah, I, I think the temporal parietal junction is involved. I think it's involved in, in ideation of what the problem is and in developing compassion, which is a separate, slight, to me, is a slightly separate thing from um, empathy, or it is separate, separate thing from empathy. But you know, for, for me to have compassion for another individual, I have to use my visual cortex. I have to use my extra striate cortex. So there really isn't a part of the brain that goes to waste uh, in our behaviors. We're just trying to get places where instead of being 60% involved, it's 95% involved or something. But, but these are even that way of formulating the involvement is probably wrong. The brain works as a whole, lots of places and contribute. And I and I don't doubt for a second the temporal bridal junction is one of those places. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so, what are the kinds of behavior that in... Hold out for a second, the temporal junction is one of those places. Okay. And so, what are the kinds of behavior that induce or invoke empathy in animal models? Is it one example, for example, when animals see others in distress the, or something like that? So, that we don't know is the short answer because there's a lot of, there's a lot of what I would call helping and the empathy that proceeds that can proceed helping is a very large multidimensional parameter space. There are lots of factors that go into it. Um, we've studied a particular paradigm where the, where one individual is in distress and the other one detects that distress. Um, and so we can say that in that situation, a rat will help another rat. Uh, are there, but in, in human interactions, empathy can work on all sorts of emotions. It doesn't have to be sadness. It doesn't have to be distress. It can be, I, I remember back in the days when I used to watch the news, which I no longer do, um, <laughs> because I don't believe it's healthy for, for humans. Um, uh, I would see Anderson Cooper on CNN and every once in a while he'd have a giggle fit. And and you 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 would be hard pressed not to laugh with him. And, right. and you've seen this in situation also in in clips, video clips where one anchor starts to laugh and the whole group of them just breaks out into laughter. That's just as much empathy as helping somebody who has fallen on the street. Um, another situation where it happens a lot is, say if you go to a funeral, you may not particularly, you may be going because it's the friend of a friend or, or it's the right thing to do. You may not have had the particular close bond and you may be crying right along there with the, 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 the family. It's very difficult to be in that incredibly sad emotive crying environment and not also cry. Mm -hmm. um, so empathy uh, can happen for any type of, of behavior. Um, another example, as you know, is babies in a group. If one of them starts to cry, the others start to cry. So there's lots of ways in which we can communicate our affect, and we do under in lots of different affects that we communicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I guess that the way we react to other people's behavior and if we feel empathy or not for them, it also depends uh, on the context and on the individual in question. I mean, perhaps it's, it's much easier for me to feel empathy for a friend or for a member of my family than for any other people, right? I think that's exactly right. Um, it's easy. It's how you feel. The empathy you feel depends on the, the person that's involved, the individual involved, the need. So is it that they need $5 to take the bus? Is it that they need $1,000 to pay off a gambling bet? Or are they in a car that's crushed under debris after an earthquake? Uh, under different circumstances, sometimes it will make a difference who the person is. But other times, so for example, when you're, when an individual's crushed in a car under debris, you don't care if it's a stranger or your best friend, you're going to go help. Right. So there, um, so this is the multidimensional parameter space. And what we've studied in the rats is, is a very narrow little area of that space. And what we can see is that, that with, we, we presented a moderate, stress or a moderate need they're in this tube they're not in agonizing distress but we know that they would not they would rather not be in there if we turn the door around 
they open the door and get out. Okay, mm -hmm. so they'd rather not be there. Um, uh, and for the helper, the the level of engagement and the level of uh, what they need to do is very low. They just need to open this door. It's difficult for them to figure it out, but the act is not taxing, and it's not certainly not life threatening. Um, and in that situation, what we find is that rats will help. They don't care who the rat is, not the individual, but they will only help the rats that of a kind that they have met before, that they have lived with before. So if they're familiar with the type of rat, they'll help any individual rat, stranger or, or familiar, doesn't matter. But if they are unfamiliar with the type of rat, they won't help. Mm -hmm. And does it also depend on the fact that uh, they have already established a relationship of reciprocity with that specific individual or not? No, no, there's no reciprocity in our experiments. The, the, the rat, there's always one trapped rat, one free rat. So this rat, the trapped rat, um, has never done anything for the free rat. And it and there's no relationship. These can be total strangers. When we first discovered this, David Rogers, who was an undergraduate in the lab, did an experiment where he had 12 different rats that were placed in the uh, in their strainer in the in the trapped in the tube each day. You know, for 12 days, 12 different different rats, and the helper rat helped them all. It, so it really doesn't matter whether the helper rat knows the trapped rat. And I think that's a pretty interesting um, finding. And I think that we have, there's a lot of, um, there's a belief within the human empathy field that familiarity, individual familiarity plays a big role. And I think it does under certain circumstances, but under other circumstances, I don't think it does. Um, and I think that, you know, my own life experiences uh, match that. If helping is easy to do and you, it's clear what you need to do to help, you'll help a stranger. Think about somebody coming in on crutches and there's a door. You know what to do. Open the door for the person on crutches. Um, and you don't care if you know them or not. And you don't care if anyone's watching you or not. You just do that because it's the right thing to do. And it's easy to do. So the, that's, I, th I think that individual familiarity is um, a little overemphasized in the human, uh, in the human field of empathy, in the field of human empathy, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I guess that's very interesting, those findings, because I guess that from an evolutionary perspective, perhaps it would make more sense for us to expect that uh, individual animals would show more helping behavior toward others with whom they were genetically related or with whom they had already established a relationship of reciprocity, like friendship, right? Right, and what and the other thing we found is that it's way more the latter than the former. So in other words, it's way more what are the relationships rather than what's the genetics. Mm. Um, the genetics don't do not appear to play any role. And so to prove to to test that, what we did was a really fun experiment where we put albino rats on the day they were born into a litter of black caped rats. And so they lived their entire life with black cape rats, black cape rat litter, mother, and then when they were weaned, they were uh, housed with a black cape rat brother, litter mate brother. And um, so they grew up never seeing an albino rat, only seeing black cape rats. And when they're adults, we tested those rats either with black cape rats strangers or with albino strangers. And, of course, they help the black cape rat strangers because they've lived their whole lives with them. Um, and, but lo and behold, they didn't help the albino rats. So they're not helping their own genetic match 
uh, they have no way to know that they are a genetic match. And if you think about it, we don't really know that we're, what we mistake for genetic match is, is environmental familiarity. Um, who you are is who you see around you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you, you, you don't have a DNA fingerprinting ability uh, any more than you know, we ha haven't had throughout history until very recent days. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so uh, now I would like to ask you about uh, a particular thing that uh, Paul Bloom wrote about in his book Against Empathy, because since we're talking about empathy here, uh, the book was out, I guess, two years ago, so and it got a lot of press and attention. So uh, there, at a certain point, he distinguishes between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. And I guess that the first kind would be the person feeling the same as the other person is feeling and cognitive empathy would mean that the person would just know about what the, per the other person is feeling without feeling the same way, something like that. Do, do you agree that there's those two kinds of separate uh, empathies, let's say? So. So for, let, me, let me first say that I'm a huge fan of Paul Bloom's work. And I, I, um, Against Empathy is, is definitely one of my favorite books. Um, we, we, don't, we haven't published this, but we don't see a distinction uh, between cognitive and emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would say that the reason... The, Emotional and cognitive, these are, these are very human constructs that I don't know that they match um, what the brain's reality is. It, I, I think that probably, I would argue that emotion is a piece of cognition. And that emotion and thought are kind of, are they're, they're intertwined. And in Lisa Feldman Barrett's uh, wonderful book, How Emotions Are, Are Made, uh, she talks about the fact that in, in some languages, in some cultures, there is no separate word for emotion versus thought. So I, that's, that's not sort of high on my list to, 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 to um, to divide these into two meaningful biological uh, uh, categories. But what I do think Paul Bloom is absolutely 100% correct about is his distinction between empathy and compassion. Hmm. And the w I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for him. I, po I couldn't possibly speak for him. But my take from having read his work is that in empathy, there's this idea that you're sharing with another. Um, and in compassion, there's this idea that you have ideation about another. And if you take the example, you can take a lot of different examples, but one easy one to think about is take an example of a kid who falls down and you know, screams bloody murder right? They're just, they're just distraught over either they fall down or they lose their, their blanket or some catastrophe in their world occurs to them. And the parent feels compassion for them as they're kind of laughing at them, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of laughing at this kid because this kid is just blowing this thing way out of proportion. You're not, that's not empathy. That's compassion. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, and, and I believe that this is one of the main takeaways from Paul's book, is that compassion is a much more, um, um, it's a much more useful uh, motivation for caregiving, for thoughtful and appropriate 
um, actions that are oriented to help others. Mm -hmm. Okay, correct. And uh, I don't know if this helps here or not, but I've been talking with a lot of evolutionary psychologists and with people like, for example, Lida Cosmides and Deborah Lieberman. And uh, in regards to the discussion surrounding emotion and cognition, I guess that Deborah Lieberman in her last book, uh, Objection, Disgust, Morality and the Law, talks about, their, uh, about emotions there in a way that I think is really helpful here. That is, she, she talks about them as being uh, another set of cognitive tools that we evolved to deal with evolutionarily relevant problems. And she talks about disgust, particularly to avoid the infection and contamination. But uh, I mean, would, would, uh, would you agree with that approach about talking of emotions as cognitive tools? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and you, I mean, cognitive even is a, is a construct. We have to remember that we're using these linguistic terms they have no power. Sure. They're just shorthand. They have no meaning. The only, the, the quest as a scientist is to find ways to describe the natural world that doesn't butcher the reality of the natural world. But the words don't have any special um, uh, reality unto themselves. Only the reality we give them. So I, I'm... I think it's always important to remember that we were using these shortcuts and, and to resist the resist the urge to reify, right? To make a thing out of something when it may not be a thing. Mm -hmm. You have to make things that match what biology is, and that is a big, big challenge. Um, I think it's I think it's really difficult in this realm where we think that. Empathy is a thing, and empathy, I think I know what empathy feel, how empathy feels, and then because of that, somebody could interpret the fact that I think that the rat feels that. Well, I don't know what the rat feels. It's a short cut. It's kind of like empathy, but it's a rat version. But I don't even know what your version of empathy feels, how that feels. So your, my version of empathy, your version of empathy, are they the same? We don't really know that. I doubt it. But they're probably a little closer than, than to what the rat feels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so earlier you referred to the role that the prefrontal cortex plays here. But uh, again, going to the literature, people usually talk about two different parts of the prefrontal cortex, which I guess modulate emotions in different, way, in different ways, like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex prefrontal cortex. So could you tell us about that? I, I really can't. Um, oh, okay. I really can't. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't do that, that work and I, I haven't uh, I haven't paid attention to the nitty gritty there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Fair enough. No problem. Uh, and uh, again about empathy uh, it's interesting because uh, there are certain conditions like psychopathy, where people tend to say that psychopaths don't feel empathy. But, uh, I mean, if psychopaths uh, manipulate people, and the, uh, I mean, I guess that to be able to do that, they at least have to know uh, fairly well what is going around in people's heads when they behave in certain ways or the effects that their own behavior and what they say have on other people. So uh, does it really make sense to say that psychopaths don't feel uh, empathy or, or that perhaps there are parts of their emotional tools that, that don't work uh, in them as in other people? I, so. If going into it without any data, there, there are absolutely two possibilities and, and a range of variations upon them. 
So the two possibilities are the psychopaths feel nothing uh, for anyone else, and so they're not motivated to do anything. The other possibility is that they feel they feel completely for others. They can get those feelings, but they don't care about them. They don't transform those uh, feelings uh, into something, uh, into an action. Um, or they transform them into weird actions. Instead of transforming it into helping, they transform it into hurting in a empathically driven way. So, you know, empathy, by the way, is a very neutral term. It just means I know, we know how each other feels. So what can I do with that? I can help you if I can detect that you're in distress, but I could also heap on to your distress. I could, I could have a personalized cruelty that would also be driven by empathy. So that empathy is neutral. And so, so either psycho psychopaths don't feel it to begin with, or they make this weird transform. They feel it and then they do something weird with it. Like, you know, they see a person with crutches and instead of opening the door, they put an obstacle in front of the door. That's, that's a sign that they're, they get it, but they're doing something very um, not typical with that information. And which of those two um, are, are, are involved? Um, you would have to talk to, to somebody such as Jean de Cidi, who's actually studied psychopaths. Um, and um, I suspect that there are a wide range of individuals with um, problems in both of these. Um, one of the things that a, a lot of that a lot of individuals on the um, autism spectrum will say is some of them will say, "I completely feel." They feel empathy. It's not that they don't feel it; it's that they, for whatever reason, they can't show and act upon those feelings. Um, in our rats, it's interesting, we have about 25% of our rats aren't helpers. And so we, we ask the question, are these essentially rat versions of psychopaths or is there something else going on? And so what we did was we exposed, the, exposed a bunch of rats to a trap rat and we measured their stress hormone response. So this is corticosterone, which is the rat version of cortisol. And what we found was that the rats that had the highest corticosterone response were the ones that eventually never helped. Hmm. So it's not that the rat, so that, that not helping um, can stem not only from being a psychopath, but also from feeling too much. There's too much emotion, too much caring, and they become overwhelmed and paralyzed and don't help. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess that if rats or even people get really too much distressed by what is happening with the other individual, perhaps they just want to get away from there, right? They, or, or something they, like that. They just they just, they're, they're for, I mean, in our situation, it's a, there's not a lot place to go. So it's a pretty small um, arena, testing arena. So they just go into a corner. They don't exactly freeze, but they, they go into a corner and, and become, they disengage, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really want to help that individual, right, in, their, in its situation. I, I wouldn't say that. I don't know that they don't want to help. Okay. I would say that they are overcome with their own stress such that they do not find a way to help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and are there other emotions that we know of that might interfere with empathy and helping behavior? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Um, an experiment that we did a while ago that we've never published, um, we 
it was real, really an unpleasant experiment. Um, we tried to have rats be bullied mm-hmm. by we had we had uh, albino rats, and they were being bullied by either albino rats or black caped rats. And and first of all, the bu- the rats were never that nasty to each other. They weren't great, you know. They they never bit each other. They would sort of engage in things, but they it wasn't it wasn't horrible, but um, they didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And on the side of the room were their cage mates. Their cage mates were not involved in the in these interactions. And what we found was that all of the rats whether they had been quote unquote bullied or whether they had been sitting 10 feet away, all of them stopped helping. They stopped helping white rats. They had stopped helping black rats. It didn't matter. They, so enough stress in the environment just says, no, I'm retreating. I'm not going, I'm not going to make other oriented actions. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that that's, I think that's true. If, if you're having the worst day of your life, you, you know, you had a bad day at work, you got in a traffic accident, your kid is sick, uh, I, you know, whatever, all those things, there are bills that you can't pay. You're highly stressed. Your ability to give to others is much, is very depleted. Helping is a resource depleting action and you got to have some resources to, to do it. It's resource depleting both in economic terms, but also in um, emotional or affective terms. Mm-hmm. Okay. And going back to the brain and brain mechanisms, what are the main hormones and neurotransmitters that play a role in empathy? I, I guess that the first that would come to mind would be oxytocin. I, I'm not sure if it really plays a role there, but people talk a lot about it. And in the news, it is called the love hormone or something like that. But uh, does it play a role there? And apart from oxytocin, what else? Well, the, you know, I, I have a sort of a similar feeling about um, neurotransmitters as I do about brain areas. There are a, a lot of neurotransmitters involved. There isn't a, there is not a function of the nervous system that does not, not require glutamate and GABA. So to disengage, you know, to say glutamate's involved is, oh yeah, well, okay, glutamate's involved. <laughs> so is GABA. So, um, of course, <clears throat> I, as far as neurotransmitters that have a particular role, yeah, oxytocin has gotten a, a lot of attention. Let's, let's kill and nail shut the coffin on this love hormone business. Mm-hmm. Um, oxytocin is, uh, my best guess from reading various studies on oxytocin um, is that it's a very good modulator of learning circuits in affective pathways. Okay. In other words, you're expect you're exposed to some social situation. You can learn something from that. You can learn to hate those people. You can learn to like those people. You can learn to affiliate. You can learn to run away from them. You'll learn it better in the presence of oxytocin. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're looking at your little baby, you, there's gaze, oxytocin's on board. You're going to learn that look. It's going to be more familiar, more comforting, more regular, more enhanced. That that it's going to enhance that learned uh, connection. Um, uh, but it can enhance negative social behaviors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or, or what we typically call negative affects as well. Mm-hmm. Um, besides that, it, it, there's just no question that vasopressin, that the monoamines, serotonin, um, are, are very likely involved because they're, they're involved in affective processing. Um, and, uh, and something that's less examined 
is the involvement of the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And so the involvement of ACTH, of, of cortisol, and, a, and then of the sympatho, the adrenal sympatho ex excitation. So sympathetic activation, to what extent does it matter when you're feeling for another individual, whether you can become bodily aroused. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the interesting findings is that people that are on beta blockers, so if you're on a beta blocker, your ability to raise your heart rate is limited. It's capped. <clears throat> and that empathy is, is restricted, is decreased in these individuals on beta blockers so that anything that you do to calm the body down is going to antagonize your ability to have to feel empathy now the kicker is that those individuals will make a more moral judgment so mm -hmm. empathy goes down morality goes up and i think that this is a poorly understood um, concept in in the world at large, but they're not. They don't go together, as Paul Bloom I think beautifully illustrates. They go in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I guess that the part you just said about oxytocin, the first thing that came to my mind was Robert Sapolsky's book Behave where he says at a certain point that the effects that oxytocin have depend on the type of individual we're dealing with and if we identify him or her as being part of our in-group or out-group because if it's someone from uh, that has a uh, group identity different from ours then perhaps their oxytocin promotes some sort of anti-social behavior or something like that right right mm -hmm. yeah yeah Okay, so the last question would be, and this is because I've read in, you, in one of your papers uh, that you talk there about differences between uh, how um, pro-social behavior is driven in humans and other animals, particularly non-primate mammals. And I'm just going to quote you here. Uh, you say, where is human pro-social behavior is often driven by empathic concern for another. It is unclear whether non-primate mammals experience a similar motivational state. So, could you to, could you explain this this sentence? Please? Yeah. So, so empathy is a mirror. There's a, there there are levels of empathy, and so a very uh, low level is just motor mimicry. If I cross my arms while I'm talking to somebody, they'll cross their arms eventually. Um, every, I think everyone's sort of seen that in action, or if you haven't seen it, now that I remind you or tell you about it, you'll see it. Um, and then there's there's these levels where you understand that this other that the um, an issue is another's issue, not your own. There's a separation of the self from the other, and that the action has to be oriented towards the other in order to to uh, have an effect um, and that's where that's empathic concern so in the in the lingo empathic concern is not just I cross my arms you cross your arms but concern for another knowing that it is another that has a dis that is in some type of distress and um, and that's what our rats are showing Mm -hmm. They're showing, they are show they, they are acting as though they feel empathic concern. Do they feel empathic concern? I don't know. I can't know whether they feel empathic concern. All I can say is they're acting, a, the most parsimonious explanation for their actions is that that mammal is acting just the way this mammal would act and if this mammal were doing that action, I would call it empathic concern. So I'm going to call it empathic concern for the rat. That said, 
I don't know how the rat experiences that internally. I doubt that that feels exactly the same for the rat as it does for me. But I would also imagine that there's a huge overlap. Mm -hmm. I don't think that when we go and help others, I think the, the bottom line is many people would say when we go and help others, we're saying, oh, I should be a good person. I should do unto others as I would want them to have to do unto me, what we call the golden rule. But the alternative that is suggested by our work is that that's not what's going on when we help others. That's the justification we put on it afterwards. But what's really going on is that we feel uncomfortable. We feel biologically uncomfortable and biologically bound to do something for another who's in distress, just the same way that the rats appear to to um, feel feel motivated to help another in distress. Mm -hmm. And would there be any neuroscientific or neurobiological approach for us to be certain that uh, another animal from another species really felt that kind of empathic concern as we do? Because I guess that in humans we have the advantage that people can report what they feel, right? But I mean, human report is very overrated. Mm very overrated and and you know let's let's not get too excited about our ability to understand the human mind uh you know your blue and my blue are different blues okay. uh, so from very low level we're experiencing the world we experience is a construct of our own brains for us to compare our experiences um it's a pretty difficult. It's a pretty difficult uh, challenge, even between two humans. So I think that we can get close. We can get close with approximation and with an understanding that language, language is it, it, it's dangerous. If I called, if I called impact concern, if I called it process X. Mm -hmm. It would have so much less, uh, it would engender so much less controversy. Right. And then we could say that this human appears to be acting from a motivation that we call process X, and the rat also appears to be acting from a motivation that looks just the same as process X. So we're going to call it the rat version of process X. That's essentially where we're at. And then the unfortunate thing is that process X happens to be empathy. So everyone's very, <laughs> very excited about it. Um, but I, I do think that the, I think it makes the rat uncomfortable to see another rat in distress. So that is not different from what I can tell. That is not different from what the, from the experience that we typically try as empathy mm -hmm. yes uh, and wouldn't you say as well that even in humans we've got the complication that uh, I mean we are not really that good or at least not as good as we think uh, in identifying the real causes and motivations that underlie our behavior right so. we're, we're terrible <laughs> we're terrible we just make up stories you know, look at this. Look, look at the split brain patients and realize that we're doing that. We're just a, able to coordinate what we say across the across the midline a little bit better. But we're doing that. We're just making up stuff all the time. So in in some ways, um, the rats can give us an insight that we are going to be blinded to because we're so busy making up all this fiction. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting. Okay, so Dr. Mason, just before we go, uh, are there any other uh, any good places on the internet where people can go to find out more about your work? Yeah, um, you can go to thebrainissocool.com, which mm -hmm. is uh, my blog, and I have a, a, a new blog post that 
is very, I shall say, very pregnant. Oh, do any day now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, basically, if you, if you uh, Google Peggy Mason, rats, empathy, chocolate, you'll get a lot of hits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but people don't uh, don't uh, can't forget the chocolate part, right? <laughs> don't forget the chocolate part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great. So I will be leaving links to that in the description box of the video. And so, Dr. Mason, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you. It was really a fun and interesting conversation. So thank you a lot for taking the time. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. Uh, I've started this channel in February 2018 and I've been putting out regular interviews, a lot of them with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And so if you can, please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge. Even just one dollar would already be a great help. And otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription Bot button, the usual stuff, right? And I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, and, and I'm very proud of this one, my first ever producer, Izar Webb. Thank you for all.